Welcome everybody. Measure what matters to improve government uh, performance. I'm Howard Rome, um, co-founder and uh, president of the Balanced Scorecard Institute. Um, by way of a little background, I uh, co-founded the uh, Institute uh, about 25 years ago after spending about uh, 25 years in uh, government service, federal government service. Uh, also uh, started the uh, U.S. Foundation for Performance Measurement, which uh, we merged into the uh, Balanced Scorecard Institute. I uh, spent a couple of years as a consultant with Booz Allen and Hamilton and have done uh, work with the Association for Strategic Planning on the board and on uh, several of the uh, committees. Uh, I've been doing uh, performance measurement and management and strategic planning uh, for a long time. And it's a pleasure to uh, present, co-present with uh, Scott Coble. Scott, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Really nice to talk to you and honored to speak with you today, Howard. Um, a little bit about my background. I spent 20 years in, in government, so I was in both local government and federal government for many years. Like Howard, I also have an engineering background um, and worked uh, in foreign language for the federal government for many years. But the reason I'm here today, I ended up as budget manager for Montgomery County, Maryland. So I live right outside of Washington, DC, if you're familiar with that part of, of the United States. And in our uh, budget office, we dealt with performance. So we had a office of county stat that helped us collect and measure our KPIs. And it was ingrained in our DNA to look at our performance, measure our outcomes, and put budget towards those outcomes. And so what we're going to talk about today is a lot of things the governments struggle with and how both uh, the Balanced Scorecard Institute and my company, OpenGov, help governments do a better job of measuring performance. So I'll turn it back to you, Howard. All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, four major things that uh, we want to share with you today. Um, derive meaningful performance measures for government programs and services. Uh, emphasis on the word derive. Uh, and you'll see why I uh, uh, say that uh, as we go through the uh, program. Uh, we're gonna show you a disciplined process for identifying the measures that matter, share some examples with you, uh, talk about budgeting for performance and incorporating performance information into the budget formulation uh, process with uh, OpenGov software. And then finally, how can we use performance information to help improve and inform decision-making. So that's the agenda for today, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we've um, been doing this, as I mentioned, for about uh, 25 years, uh, working uh, all over the world with uh, governments and quasi-governments and nonprofits and for-profits, and uh, I've got a lot of experience to share with you, a lot of things we've seen that work pretty well and some things that we've seen uh, don't work as well. Uh, but uh, this is a sample of the folks that we have, uh, we have worked with. We uh, have worked in over 300 organizations in 40 countries now. And with our certification uh, programs, training programs, uh, we jointly certify with uh, George Washington University, the College of Professional Studies. Uh, we've trained about 10,000 folks from about 90 countries now and in uh, six languages. Scott? Yeah, and with OpenGov, we're a technology company and we're focused only on government. So as of today, we have over a thousand governments that we work with across the entire United States and Australia. Um, we focus in on budgeting, performance, transparency, procurement, all the core government operations that, that are day in and day out, things that everyone does are what, are what OpenGov supplies in terms of software for our customers. Um, one of the things you see on the screen here, and, and obviously we do have a lot of metrics that we measure on our own software, is about how we can reduce time that governments are putting towards meaningless tasks. And a lot of this, what we'll talk about today, is around budgeting and performance and how we can save time and help you achieve outcomes. Howard, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about a disciplined um, process. You know, there's a lot of reasons why we are interested in performance measurement for government, and a few of them are listed here. We want to be able to showcase our, our program and our service effectiveness and show that we're, in fact, creating value for taxpayer dollars. Uh, we want to include uh, and improve accountability for results, put more emphasis on what we're trying to accomplish, the outcomes, uh, better informed decisions that we're making around programming and services. 
better inform the budget uh, formulation process, uh, use performance information to continuously improve processes, make them more efficient, make our programs more effective, and to reduce uncertainties uh, along the, uh, uh, the whole uh, cycle from uh, customer facing uh, processes uh, right back to, uh, back to resources. Uh, there are some things that stand in the way, some challenges, some obstacles that uh, we obviously have to deal with. Um, one is that the KPIs, and I'll, I'll use KPIs and performance measures uh, interchangeably. Uh, I know we could have a long nuanced discussion of the difference between a KPI and a performance measure, but I think uh, for the purpose of uh, today, we'll uh, just go ahead and use those interchangeably. What we find is that KPIs aren't linked very well to results, the results that the organization wants to achieve. They tend to focus on inputs and, and uh, you know, activities, uh, not the outputs and the outcomes that we want from the, uh, uh, from the programs and services that we're responsible for. A lot of organizations have a lot of measures. A lot of them are lagging after the fact. These are indicators that uh, don't give us much guidance on where the organization is headed uh, or where it should be headed, giving us information on, uh, on options. Um, lack of ownership, lack of accountability. We don't see a lot uh, of uh, accountability attached to the performance measures. They, they're, uh, they're counted because somebody told us we have to count them, count things, right? That's why a lot of performance measurement uh, programs are not very successful. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, measures, a lot of data, not much information. And so what we're trying to do is sort through that you know, separate uh, the wheat from the chaff and get to the good stuff. And so that's what we're, uh, we're going to share with you today. A lot of times we see KPIs that uh, are selected because they're easy to count. Um, you know, if we're sitting around a room saying, what should we measure? The first tendency, uh, natural human tendency is to count the easy stuff. And uh, those are usually uh, inputs and sometimes outputs too. Uh, and lastly, uh, something I've seen, I've traveled the world uh, doing this stuff for, for many years. We see an awful lot of KPIs that are picked because everybody uses these, right? Uh, my friend said this is the right uh, measures that we should be using. So how do you create measures? So here's some options, right? We can, uh, some of the software packages that are available have uh, libraries of measures by sector, by department. Uh, there's a university book, uh, a book of measures. I think it has something uh, like eight or 900 pages, a compendium of performance measures, or we could buy a book on the 75 measures that everybody has to know. Uh, we could ask uh, Alexia, or we could do a Google search, or what usually happens, uh, we get a few folks sitting around a conference room, and the key question they ask is, okay, what should we measure? Our experience is that uh, these different approaches inform the discussion, the conversation, but they're really not a substitute for a, for a process, for a discipline on helping to get to the measures that matter. The example in the last slide ended with, okay, what should we measure? You know, a group of folks sitting around a table asking a question. That's, that's the wrong question uh, to ask. It's an important question, but it's not the first question. Uh, the first question is, what are we trying to accomplish? So by asking that question first, you, you sort of immediately take the, uh, the conversation in a new direction. It's not just about what we're doing in this program or service area. It's about what does an outcome look like through the eyes of the people that we serve? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, for those of you who have taken uh, Stephen Covey uh, training, I think uh, one of the leadership principles, uh, number two, if uh, memory serves, I took that course a long time ago, was begin with the end in mind. Uh, over and over again, as we have uh, worked with uh, organizations of all shapes and sizes and, and types and sectors, uh, starting with the end in mind makes a huge difference. It is a game changer. If you can start the conversation, not about you know what does my program need next year from a fiscal point of view, right, from a budget point of view, but started by saying, you know, who benefits, what are we trying to accomplish? and then ask the follow-up questions. Second question is how will we know success when we see it, right? What does accomplishment look like in concrete terms, right? Not abstract, you know, not fluffy. What does it mean in concrete sensory terms? And now we're ready for the question that most folks ask first and we ask in the third position, how will we monitor 
and see whether we are in fact being successful or there's a lack of success as we motor along toward the uh, goals that we have set for ourselves. So the discipline starts from high altitude and we always like to start with the hard measures first. Those are the strategic measures. How am I gonna measure outcomes and uh, intermediate and end outcomes, right? And the way you start that is by talking first about what you're trying to accomplish. And the way you talk about what you're trying to accomplish is to start with mission and vision. That's the way we found after trying an awful lot of different approaches. Uh, how, do you, you know, how do you get to the, to the measures that matter? So we start there and we ask ourselves at the next level, drop down an altitude a little, you know, what's our strategy and, and our plan? Strategy is an approach and a plan from many options that we have for delivering our programs and services. What are we gonna select as the way we're gonna to proceed to deliver on the promises we've made in our mission and our vision and our values? Third level, how do we align the programs and services with the strategy? And the fourth level, when we get down to the desktop or to the shop floor, you know, how do teams and individuals align and prioritize the work that they do and get the important stuff done. So by thinking from high altitude to low altitude and thinking from end accomplishment to what do I need to do to deliver that, um, what you're doing, the basic principle here is looking for cause effect relationships. You know, at the heart of a good performance measurement system in our experience is this idea that things are related. There's causes and there's effects. And so what you're gonna see for the rest of the presentation is a is a play on that uh, logical framework. So there's really uh, two parts to uh, getting to, uh, to the discipline process. The one is, first one is to find the right measures. And then the second one is to use that information in meaningful ways to improve decision-making and better inform the choices that, uh, that folks are making. Um, we've developed a model to do this, a disciplined model, uh, the EMPRA KPI model, we call it. And so on the left, we have the find the right measures components, right? And, you know, this, when you think about performance measures, most folks think of it sort of narrowly, right? They put a fence around their program or their service, you know, and, and start with the, what should we measure question. Uh, a good performance measurement program is really a high level program that leadership is behind. It's not just about checking the boxes because somebody said we need to measure stuff. Right, so we're gonna start a, a measurement program by getting leadership engaged in answering a question on everybody's mind, why do we wanna measure, right? Why are we going through this process? What are we gonna, what's in it for me as an employee? What's in it for my uh, government agency, right? What's the benefits? Um, we're gonna establish some teams and we're gonna lay out roles and responsibilities so folks know what they're, uh, what they're responsible for we're going to agree on a process and the procedures we're going to use to implement that process. We're going to understand where we are in the automation selection process. Do we have software in place? Are we buying software? Uh, are, we, are we going to use uh, uh, just spreadsheets? Or are we going to go with more sophisticated um, uh, reporting software, for example? And then the other thing you got to think about here is, you know, you're not just creating a measurement program. Measures are a means to an end. They're not the end. Uh, you know, at its heart, what you're really doing is trying to, trying to build a high performance organization and using performance measures as one of the inputs to, to getting to high performance. You're essentially creating a changing hearts and minds uh, uh, initiative. That's what a, a good performance measurement system is. It's really a change management initiative, uh, which is why we want leadership involved and why we want uh, the change management folks involved thinking about how we're going to take advantage of the innovation and the technology, you know, and the new uh, uh, agility that we're trying to build into our organization. How do we how do we change hearts and minds as part of this process? Uh, last part of the getting ready, the launching the program is articulating and communicating the agency's strategic intent. Remember, starting with mission and vision, we're going to break that down into uh, strategy, strategic themes, and results. We call them. And we're gonna break that down and align the organization around strategy. So how do we communicate that? And then we're gonna jump over to uh, intended results. The way we're gonna communicate that strategy is through a set of strategic themes and a set of strategic objectives. Uh, typical organizations will have about a dozen 
maybe 14 strategic objectives at the enterprise-wide level. And these are the uh, continuous improvement activities that the organization does to improve uh, value, to create value for citizens and other stakeholders. So following our own advice, where we said, you know, talk about the accomplishments first, we're gonna describe those as intended results that we want. Uh, then we'll understand some alternative measures at how we can measure those intended results, make some choices, and then define and document. And then we're ready to start measurement. So we're to the other side, the performance review cycle. We'll set some targets and thresholds around the measures we've created. Now we're into the performance. Part of performance is uh, running the programs and services that we're setting the measures for in addition to the strategy that's driving those programs and services. Uh, as a result of the conversations that we've had on finding the right measures, inevitably the teams will develop some ideas for new initiatives or new projects that will help improve performance of the organization. We wanna address those as part of this process, implement improvement initiatives, uh, collecting and visualizing the performance information. Then we go to a review cycle where we analyze and draw conclusions. What do we learn? We've transformed performance data into information and we've transformed into information into useful business intelligence, two, two transformations. Then we're gonna adapt, we're gonna learn and we're gonna grow. We're gonna share the information. And then we go back through a feedback loop typically once a year to adapt the new learning and what, we've, uh, uh, what we have uh, picked up and decided to do more of and do less of, and then go back through a, uh, through a cycle again. So performance measurement is not static, right? It's dynamic, we get smarter on which measures matter the most. We won't get it right on the first pass uh, of a cycle like this. You will get smarter as you uh, uh, do it uh, each year. Some measures will drop off because they're not providing the useful information you thought they are, and other measures, new measures will be added. Another dimension to this is uh, what we call the types of measures, right? You have to have different hats on to measure uh, different things. Strategy is different than operations. So when we think of strategic or, or, or impact measures, you know, those are the program measures. When we worry about how effective our programs and services are, those are the measures that we're interested. What are we actually accomplishing, right? On the operational side, these tend to be more departmental measures, and we think of those more in operational terms. Operationally, we think of inputs and process measures and outputs, number of things that, uh, that we produce or number of people we serve, for example. There's also a set of project measures uh, as uh, defined by the Project Management Institute. They have four types of uh, measures, schedule adherence, resource adherence, scope creep, and uh, risk. So those are important considerations as we are uh, running our, uh, uh, keeping the trains running on time, I like to say, in the operational side. When we come to uh, program measures or strategic measures, we're interested in the intermediate outcomes, and then we're interested in the end outcomes. Uh, by way of example, an intermediate outcome of a uh, disaster relief program is that relief is provided in a timely manner. But what we really want to know is whether people's lives have improved as a result of our program, and that's the end outcome. So this combination of things gives us the ability to put our performance measurement stethoscope in various parts of this uh, cause-effect relationship cycle. And what we end up with then is picking and choosing for our reporting format, which of these things we want to measure to inform decision making. Uh, here's an example. This uh, on the operational side, this is a program uh, to uh, uh, reduce dropout rates uh, for kids. It's a dropout prevention program. So on the input side, we'd measured the dollars we're going to spend on it, the budget or the number of FTEs that we've devoted to it. On the process side, we might be interested in the quality or consistency of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the delivery of the program, the timeliness of the program. We might be interested in how many people took the program, how many programs did we hold, and so on for the output side. On the strategic side, on the impact side, uh, you know, we want to reduce trial dropout rates, right? That's the ultimate, uh, that, that's the ultimate goal here. Uh, we also want to see graduations, behavior improvements in kids, uh, school attendance, cause effect. Remember, right? We would expect 
school attendance to, to improve and child dropout rates to, uh, to, to improve as well, reduce those rates. On the project side, uh, we might uh, create curriculums and we're interested in how those are being uh, designed, what the resources uh, are set for those, the schedule to make changes to the program or deliver it for the first time. We'll add two more types of measures, one on the behavioral side, right? We wanna know if our instructors are delivering successfully. Can we, do we need retraining? Do we need to change the way the train the trainer program works and so on. And also the risk, we wanna be able to mitigate risks of the program not working uh, as it is intended to work. So those are the family of measures when we think about uh, having deep conversations around what? what we're trying to accomplish, right? It all is part of that same cause effect relationship that we're trying to build from the accomplishment back to what we're actually doing. Uh, to go to the strategy side for a minute, that's the hard part. Again, remember we talked about decomposing mission and vision into strategy, our path and our plan for implementing our mission and vision, given the values that we believe in. Uh, strategic objectives are sort of a key component of uh, this whole process. Uh, again, a strategic objective is a continuous improvement activity. It's got an action verb in front of it. We're actually going to do something, right? Uh, this is different than uh, your father's uh, management by objectives, uh, which is uh, where I started uh, way back when. I like to say this is not your father's Oldsmobile. Uh, strategic objectives have been defined for the you know, for, for the current period, right, to, to be continuous improvement activities. So once we define that objective, we put a fence around it, we describe what it is and what it isn't, what's inside the fence, what's not inside the fence, then we write an intended result or two for each one of those strategic objectives. An intended result is written in end state language. Assume you are wildly successful and write the result that way. Um, We'll show you some examples of that here in a minute. Once we have the intended results, we can identify some uh, KPIs for those intended results. And that's gonna give us the strategic part of our performance measurement uh, model. So those steps describe the intended result, understand some alternative measures, and then select the right measurement for each one of the objectives. We use a couple of other tools. To help get at uh, measures, not all the measure, not all measures are direct, right? We uh, we we need to measure indirectly sometimes. Uh, cause effect, remember that the fishbone diagram on the right there at the bottom is a very popular tool. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Process flow analysis to identify bottlenecks and reduce cycle times, improve quality. That's a useful tool. Uh, logic model has been widely used in uh, government for uh, quite a while inputs, process, outputs, and outcomes. So you got a number of arrows in the quiver to be able to help you sort of get, get your hands around uh, what's the right measures, what should we be measuring. Um, one of the uh, best tools we've come across in years is a strategy map. And uh, we use it uh, all the time in uh, balance scorecard work. Uh, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with a balance scorecard, it revolves around four perspectives or lenses that you can view performance of an organization through. Uh, the four uh, uh, typically used are, uh, in the case of government and nonprofit, uh, citizens and stakeholders, or in this case, this is a university client that we had learners and other stakeholders. The second perspective is financial. In the case of mission-driven organizations, it's really about stewardship, right? Making wise use of other people's money. Uh, third perspective is uh, internal business processes. And the fourth perspective, uh, Kaplan and Norton uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, called it learning and growth. Uh, we call it organizational capacity. It's a little more expansive than just human capital. It includes the technology, includes infrastructure, includes governance, includes the kind of things that you need to do to be able to deliver uh, capacity and deliver work to uh, uh, part of the value chain. Remember I talked about cause and effect. These are strategic objectives. The ovals on a, a strategy map uh, start with an action verb and they are continuous improvement objective, things that we want to become world-class at. Uh, and it's a map of how we create value 
for the, uh, the end of the value chain, in this case, learners and other stakeholders. And you actually read the, the map as an if-then logical connection between these, uh, uh, between these strategic objectives. By way of example, uh, to get to some uh, strategic measures that matter, we took this uh, strategy map and then we laid out a set of intended results for each one of those strategic objectives. Remember, an intended result is the outcome that we're looking for. And how will we know it? We're not going to we're not going to take on the whole organization, right? The, the advantage of this is that you break things down into manageable chunks. That's really what a strategy map is, that is very good at. It helps you organize the complexity of a high performance organization and chunk it down to where people can actually understand it and work on it and put a fence around it and then combine things in cause effect relationships to actually show how you create value. So in this case, the intended result of improving program services and quality is that our programs are recognized worldwide for their high quality. Now that we have that, we can talk about, well, how will we know success when we see it? Remember question number two earlier. The answer is we've got some performance measures that would help us know whether we're making progress toward that desired outcome. Then we could set some targets for the fiscal year for each of those measures. And then as a result of this conversation, inevitably, you're going to have thoughts about, well, what should we do differently? Are the current programs and services really delivering what we want? So we always have a parking lot, a flip chart back in the day when we were live, and now we do it with a Miro a whiteboard. We always have a, a, a parking lot to get capture new ideas, right? What can we do differently to move the needle within this strategic objective to get to higher performance? If we can get to higher performance in this one objective, and we apply that same thinking to the other objectives, collectively, we're going to make a difference in the organization. That's the way this logic uh, works. Okay, um, another tool that we found uh, really useful is the fishbone diagram, because it helps organize conversations around these cause effect relationships. For example, uh, one of the strategy or strategic themes we see a lot in the balanced scorecard work is something called operational excellence. It's a pillar of excellence, if you will. We want to operate our organization with excellence. And that means a whole, uh, a whole bunch of different things to different people, depending on where you sit in the organization. But so let's take a look at the desired result. We want high quality programs and services delivered on time. So we can lay out a diagram like this and say, well, what are some of the causes and effects of getting to that desired result? And how will we know success when we see it? What do we want to do? Improve citizen stakeholder satisfaction. We can identify the components of that and then set some measures for it. Same with improving product and service delivery to get to that result. Components and measures. Improve the interaction with our customer is another key bucket if you will, for, for, for getting to high quality programs and services. And so on down the line uh, until you get to the basic input, which is uh, resourcing, you know, money and FTEs and so on. So just organizing things in a disciplined way um, will help you hold conversations in the areas that are critically important to the end result. And that's the key here so that we don't have scattershot conversations. The conversations uh, are more disciplined uh, they're more deep. Um, these, these are, uh, you know, this will change the way you think about stuff. Uh, if you go through a discipline process like this with a balanced scorecard or with the KPI model, uh, this really will change the way you think about things. And it'll, it'll force the organization to ask hard questions of itself. Uh, that alone is probably worth a lot. Um, one of the things that we see a lot of is the difference between leading and lagging indicators. Folks are always uh, worried about that. Uh, it's easy to, uh, uh, to collect the lagging indicators, uh, isn't it? Uh, the uh, leading indicators, I mean, right? Those are the easy ones uh, to count precursors of potential future success, number of potholes I filled, uh, number of programs uh, I ran, number of people I put through a, a, a program and so on. Um, lag lagging indicators are what we're more interested in from a strategic point of view. So I'll use a uh, smoking succession Cessation program here is an example. A leading indicator might be the number of uh, programs that we held to uh, try and educate folks to, uh, to stop smoking. Uh, that leading indicator, uh, the cause effect 
will lead to a lagging indicator of the population that smokes, the percent of the population that smokes. And then finally, what we're really interested in is that lagging indicator becoming a leading indicator for the final lagging indicator, which is uh, what happens to uh, uh, lung cancer rates. So this is a very simple example where leading and lagging uh, are very useful. Again, remember cause effect, cause effect. We're trying to get at the things that drive the outcomes that we're most interested in. That's the whole uh, premise here. Um, sort of to, uh, to wrap up uh, my part of this, this is a, a one page balanced strategic plan. Uh, we use the uh, balanced scorecard framework that we developed 20 years ago to create this. Uh, this is based on work that we did for uh, the city of Newark when uh, Cory Booker was mayor, now Senator Booker. Uh, we laid out uh, a program of uh, uh, what's the vision or the mission, developed uh, four strategic themes, uh, wrote some intended results. I mean, all of this is done not by us, but with, uh, with, with the team of folks who are experts at this. We're the facilitators. That's what we bring to the table. But the real knowledge, the real education are the folks who, who run, the, run these programs, run, run the cities, run the governments. So now you've got the top, the high altitude stuff, very clear and very easy to understand uh, and uh, a focus, a way of building on it and get more detail later. More detail comes when we break those strategic themes into a set of strategic objectives. Remember those four perspectives? In this case, they were called constituent stakeholder, financial stewardship, business processes, and organizational capacity. Uh, people will change the names of the perspectives to fit their, uh, their organization. If we were doing this for a private sector company, financial would be in the top position and customers would be in the second position. In other words, we switch the top two perspectives because the end of the value chain for private business is profits and owner's equity. And so that's the end of the value chain. But when it comes to government, the end of the value chain is quality of life of citizens. So that's the difference in the two balanced scorecard uh, approaches. Uh, same for public, uh, um, same for nonprofits, essentially the difference between mission driven and uh, uh, private sector. So once we have the strategy map and the strategic objectives, we can set a set of measures and targets. And then again, a set of uh, new initiatives that uh, we'll pursue uh, probably next fiscal year, right? This is the, the dozen or so that make what I call the A list. Uh, if history repeats and the workshops that go behind this uh, happen, you'll end up with uh, maybe a hundred or more possible new initiatives. And through one of the steps in the framework, you winnow it down to the dozen or so that uh, would go on your A list of things that are really important to do. So that's the discipline process. Uh, it's a logical way, cause effect based uh, to get from uh, uh, what you're trying to accomplish to what you're trying to measure to show that you're actually making uh, progress towards your accomplishments. Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you. Perfect. And Howard, you can actually go to the next slide. I'll do the software after I have a quick overview here. Right. Um, so yeah, for everyone that's in, in government, um, what Howard just showed you what the Balanced Scorecard Institute can do is something that, frankly, we see almost every single government struggling with. And where that comes into play and having a framework and model is, is getting you off the ground and looking at achieving your objectives and outcomes as Howard just laid out and putting that, that framework in place is key. But there is a point then you're going to have to be able to have tools to manage your KPIs, to align your performance with budget, to communicate. And a lot of you that work in, in budget offices with the uh, Government Finance Officers Association to have that performance in your budget books. And so that's where OpenGov comes in play. And you can see on the slide uh, what we offer as a company, obviously budgeting and planning and performance. We also have, which we won't talk about today, uh, what we call citizen services. We have procurement, we have financial software, but this all helps our governments really engage with the community, uh, operate more efficiently, and then ultimately tie performance and budget together to achieve outcomes. If you go to the next slide for me, Howard. Um, one of the things, again, we kind of look at governments across the whole U.S. So we're talking towns and villages that might have, you know, 5,000 people in them all the way up to multi-billion dollar governments. This is kind of the tiers where we see uh, governments fitting in. Um, and if you look on the left, too, so the basic and advanced levels, 
this is governments that aren't to the level that Howard just went through in, in terms of having a framework in place. Um, in the basic level, there's probably hardly any KPI tracking at all. If there is, it might be just a few KPIs like Howard mentioned, because everyone else does this. So they're copying what another government has and they're just throwing it in their, their budget publications or their strategic plan just to kind of check a box. Some of the governments that are in the more advanced uh, stages there, they do have dedicated program performance measures. They probably aren't linking them directly to budget. Um, and again, it's more of a, a check the box type thing. I can tell you though, 90% of governments fit in that, that basic and advanced uh, level. Where we do see very sophisticated governments, that's when they're doing, they have that framework in place, like Howard mentioned, they're projecting out measures. So one of the things in the advanced and basic buckets, uh, a lot of governments just look at what happened in the past, and they're not actually projecting out what they're going to do from a KPI perspective in the current year or even in a, the next two years. And GFOA and, and the other body is the ICMA recommend absolutely projecting out those performance measures. The other thing in the sophisticated level, there's, Howard mentioned this at the beginning, dedicated staff or like an office of performance and accountability or a county stat or city stat offices that are managing this year round. They're actually doing performance reviews with their departments and within the programs year round and work hand in hand with budget and the executives. Um, if you go to the next slide, Howard, I think there's one more here. So when we look at it, and obviously with, with my background in budget, budget's a year-round cycle, and it's become more and more important for governments to constantly, and as Howard mentioned, continuously manage performance along with budget. So there's amendments that happen throughout the year. There's adjustments that you have to make. If anything taught us with CARES and, and COVID the last two years, governments have to be very flexible. And so constantly monitoring the performance, monitoring your budget, um, tying them together and updating your strategy is something that is a real year round uh, cycle. And you can see that kind of represented here with this chart. I think the next uh, step we'll do, and Howard, uh, if you go one more slide, um, I think the next step we'll do is um, I'll show you a little bit of software and go through some examples of governments that we work with. Um, on how they do everything from communicate their strategic goals and their plans, how they capture and manage performance measures, how they align performance to budget, um, and then ultimately how they use us for internal reporting and dashboards and communication. So with that, Howard, if you don't mind giving me screen share, I'll take control here. And Howard, there's a few questions in the, the uh, chat while I'm bringing this up that were for you, I think, specifically. Okay. So. I'll take a look at those while you're doing the uh, software demo. And if we, uh, the time we have at the end, we'll, uh, we'll tackle some of those. Perfect. Um, and Howard, can you see the uh, city of Winchester's yes. role? So I'll give you a couple examples here. And again, um, this is just one example, but the city of Winchester is a city out uh, close to where I live, um, where their finance director is also their city manager. So it's a very, it's not a, a real big city. And one of the things they did a really nice job of, even though they're getting more sophisticated with this, is being very transparent on how well they're meeting their goals and objectives. So Howard had mentioned, you know, I guess there's usually 12 to 14 goals or objectives. Um, in their case, they had five main goals and they had multiple objectives underneath it. But one of the things I thought that they did an excellent job of is being transparent. And so Mary Blow is the, the finance director there and she has the, this page up here in this case, we're looking at uh, basically economic development or how well they're doing with um, what they call working Winchester. And so they have their KPIs in here for the public to go through and they can look and see if they're on target, you know, where that Winchester is maybe not meeting their goals, right? So I think as a personally, as a someone that came from government, being transparent and open about this is key, right? No matter where you are in the country, um, we're supported by taxpayer dollars and being very upfront on, on your objectives, how well you're meeting your goals, just builds public trust. So this is one example, um, and, and this is online if you wanna look at it, it's uh, under City of Winchester strategic plan. One of the other things just to note, a lot of governments have uh, requirements. So this is a government, this is Tallahassee, Florida, again, a growing 
growing city. And one of the things the ICMA awards is performance management. And they won that certificate in 2021. And uh, I think they're going to get it again in 2022. But as you have these requirements as governments, that's something that OpenGov can help you achieve. They followed a similar model with um, Winchester, where they dive into different objectives that they had and show how well they're performing against them. It's not just limited to um, you know, your strategic plans and how you can communicate with OpenGov. So I work with a number of governments and, and Howard and I talk about this. The American Rescue Plan has a huge performance component in it. So for any of you that are working for governments over 250,000, or sorry, who have residents exceeding 250,000, you have a performance requirement to report back to the US Treasury. And so Phoenix obviously fits into that bucket and they have a whole dedicated site on how well they're performing, very transparent again and open, um, and how they're using those American Rescue Plan dollars, right? So they're aligning the funding that the federal government's getting, giving them with outcomes and meaningful measures that are gonna impact their community. Um, and to, you know, what I'm showing you now, we're showing you, as, as Howard mentioned, I'm showing you the, with the end and we'll walk through how this is all put together. But, for those of you that work in budget offices, you know there's a huge component of performance in budget, right? And so uh, this is looking at a, a typical budget page here. You know, there's a lot of information about where dollars are going, how it's gonna, you know, impact different areas of the, the programs and staffing and all that. But within budget documents, it is a requirement now from GFOA to have performance as a component. So a lot of governments are trying to get there. Um, in this case, this is a bigger government, but they have clearly outlined and just here in this table shown where their performance measures are, how they line up to goals and objectives. And so as, as Howard lays that framework down, we don't see a lot of governments that have a really consistent framework. It's kind of all over the place where you might see just a table of KPIs. And I think that's where the two companies really work well together, right? Howard can get you off the ground, get your performance measures in place, align your objectives and goals, and then we can help you uh, manage them and then communicate them both internally and externally. One other thing I wanted to show the group here today, um, equity is becoming a big thing in governments. So this has been brewing for the last few years and it just makes sense. But within equity, obviously there's a lot of components to that, um, including being able to get feedback from the public. So what we're seeing with a lot of governments, they're asking their public, in this case, how are we performing? Or how would you, um, if you had $100 of our city's funds, where would you distribute it? So that public feedback is a huge component of transparency. And I think it's often overlooked within governments that, that we see. So now we're kind of, well, I've walked you through the end here, and these are kind of some outcomes of achievements that governments have in terms of how they communicate this out to the public. You're also, what we need to do with a lot of governments is get them out of Excel. So frankly, most governments we work with are using Excel worksheets to capture the KPIs to, to kind of align them with their goals. And having an online modern cloud-based system just makes sense these days. The technology, frankly, has been around for 20 years. So having you know, a basic place where you can capture new KPIs, um, collect the measures, run them against any type of scoring system you have is something that, that again, today should be done by almost every government. The technology has been here for a long time. And what some of the more sophisticated governments will do then is not only will they have a place to manage and look at all their KPIs, they'll also then have internal alignment. So this would be like representative of a county stat or performance office where they can look and do internal evaluation. As Howard mentioned, this is a continuous process, right? So when a KPI makes sense this year, it might not make sense. And this is where you can have reviews of the KPIs, sit down as a, if a, as a leader, sit down with your departments and see how they're scoring, um, even coming up here with how they align against the outcomes and things that Howard would help you with, right? And having an official score for the KPIs. So moving just a little further then, so this is obviously the intake and management of the KPIs. You also need the ability to analyze them, right? So a lot of governments will use OpenGov, uh, they'll use us for our dashboards and reports where they can look at the KPIs collectively in a dashboard. So if you think about it, this is a public works example, looking at potholes or all those, not just the output measures, but the outcome measures as well, and looking 
at them universally in a dashboard is a nice way, again, to kind of collectively view everything. And then when you want to get down into the details, if you click on um, and click down in on those tiles, you can drill down much into a much greater level. So this is getting pretty sophisticated. We, again, when we work with governments, we don't have to start here. We can start out small, but we can scale up and get all the way to the, the level that Howard was describing in his part of the presentation. And then really, we were talking about this a lot, and this is my background. And um, one of the most important things then is as, as you work in government, I, and I'm totally biased on this, but I think budget is probably the most important thing government does, right? It's how they allocate resources how they allocate personnel, how they have new programs, how they do new infrastructure. And so all of this needs to tie back, in my opinion, strategically. So in our, when I was in Montgomery County, I left in 2018, we had eight priority areas and we aligned our budget with those eight priority areas so we could see how well we were doing against our county, executive, county executive's objectives. So we could see how well we're establishing a safe and secure community or ensuring a high quality of life. So with OpenGov, you can not only do your, your annual budgeting, but get a little more strategic on how you align up to the top and how you align to your strategic objectives. And I'll just finish up here with this. Um, the way then you would be able to communicate this, um, you need a platform to be able to basically have, and what we do with a lot of governments, templates, or basically a construction mechanism to tie everything together. And so everything we have in OpenGov just up front was built around ease of use. I think that's one of our highest qualities. Everything is point and click, drag and drop. There's no coding in the software. It's all web-based. We maintain all the versions for you. And we work with, like I showed you earlier, governments that don't have IT. So to that end, we've really put everything in the end user's hands, whether it's a budget analyst, a public works uh, staff member, a police uh, a, uh, chief, it's really used by all users of government. And so OpenGov um, provides governments with the tools, again, to make them more accountable and effective. So that's just a quick snapshot of the, of the software. Um, I know this is a small portion and we wanted to leave a little time for Q&A here. Um, but again, we'll, if you wanna reach out to either of us, Howard or, or myself on anything that you've seen today, um, please feel free to reach out. I think we put our contact information here in the next slide, which I'll now turn it back over to Howard. Thank you. Back to the uh, to the end here. <clears throat> Take a minute to uh, refresh. It looks like with. Uh, yep, and while that perfect, that's uh, our resource, pulling that up, um, <laughs> Jose, we do have language translation. So oftentimes, and I probably had it on a couple of those pages. We'll just leverage like a Google Translate that can translate into well over a hundred languages. Um, if you need to translate everything with a real translator, that's obviously a little bit more work. Um, and then Cynthia, you're talking, you had a question, you're talking governmental programs. Do you have packages for professional associations of less than 10,000 members? Um, we can work with nonprofits if that's the area. We're government focused. Um, so that's local government, state government, schools, special districts, and nonprofits. And I'll, those are the two questions for me, Howard. All right. Um, let me uh, tackle a couple of uh, the ones that have uh, come in here. I think the first one deals with um, uh, the difference between uh, mission and vision and uh, purpose. Um, the way I view it, you know, there's not universal truth on what these words mean, uh, unfortunately, in our profession. Uh, and one of the first things that we learned when we put our frameworks together is uh, make sure you agree on the dictionary, on the lexicon. Uh, you know, if my goal is your objective and I'm in one department and you're in another, uh, we're gonna have a really hard time uh, coming up with, uh, with an aligned organization, uh, tackling uh, goals and so forth. So, um, you know, a, a vision is a picture of a future to us, right? A, a mission is what we're trying to accomplish, a statement of the purpose. Um, 
when we get to the lower levels in an organization, we advise not to write separate vision and mission statements, but to write a purpose statement, which tends to be more narrow. It's specifically, how does my department support the mission and vision of the organization? Um, I've seen a lot of organizations where they have separate mission and vision statements in the departments, uh, separate from the, uh, the enterprise-wide mission and vision. Uh, I've yet to see one of those organizations have, a, have clear messaging when it comes to how they support the, the mission and vision of the parent. So we advise using the, uh, the purpose statement for that. You know, we support mission and vision by doing X with you know, Y resources uh, in the following programs and services. So purpose is, is more specific than the mission and the, uh, and the vision. Um, another uh, question on um, who's in charge of uh, performance measurement at the, uh, at the first tier. Um, I think that question needs to be answered by the you know, organization specific. Uh, we have seen uh, the strategy office responsible. We have seen line offices, department offices responsible. We've seen uh, strategy management office, SMO, project management office, uh, PMO. I've seen budget offices, chief financial officer responsible. So I don't think there's, there's just one answer to that question. Uh, we've seen dual hatting. When I was at the Atomic Energy Commission, we had dual hat. We had people who worked for me in the budget and strategic planning who were assigned directly to uh, uh, line, line management programs uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, you know, reported to me for supervision, but uh, essentially worked day-to-day uh, -day for the uh, program manager. Um, so there's all sorts of variations on a theme here, and you know, one answer won't uh, clearly won't suffice. Um, there is a strong argument for centralizing uh, this function along with the strategy function. Um, a lot of times that's, uh, that doesn't fly in government because it's an overhead item and it's hard to justify adding overhead uh, when people are asking you why didn't you devote that money to program. So uh, sometimes you have to find a hybrid way of, of, of you know, getting performance uh, measures. The point is it has to be visible. It has to be supported by senior leadership. Uh, and folks have to know why, uh, why we are measuring, right? To what end and for what benefit. So uh, that's, that, that's easy. I have not seen it performance measurement uh, the way we're talking about it, organization performance measurement in HR. Uh, I've not seen it in uh, change management, but uh, I have seen it uh, in the strategy department. Um, Another question, to implement performance measurement, must you first be certified by the Balance Scorecard Institute or as a KPI professional? No, um, I don't think that that's a requirement. Um, you will be a lot smarter if you go through the certification program. Uh, as I mentioned, we jointly certify this with uh, George Washington University, the College of Professional Studies, and those uh, programs uh, are very popular and uh, all over the world uh, taught now in uh, five or six different languages. Um, so there's, uh, there's some real good options for you on the training side. We have uh, three-day and five-day versions of our KPI and our balance scorecard courses. We have an OKR uh, certification course now. Uh, I'm working on a strategy execution certification uh, course. Um, so we're, uh, we definitely believe in training and uh, the folks who have uh, gone through uh, and some pretty strong testimonials about what it means to go through it and have a disciplined process for attacking strategic planning and measurement and uh, management. Hey, Howard, I had a, there's a question here that I was hoping you could help answer too um, from Renee. How do you get buy-in from an organization that is immature in this process? How do you get buy-in from an organization? I always uh, approach it um, regardless of uh, maturity with, um, a two-sided coin. Number one, what are the benefits of going through a program like this, right? Ask yourself the benefit question. Uh, and the flip side of that is, what are the pains that you can potentially alleviate by going through a program like this? And I would use the same, almost the same conversation if I were, you know, talking to leadership, to a, to a CEO or an assistant secretary, uh, as I would for a department head or a branch chief. I mean, it's really about you know, you have to, to, to have this be successful. 
you have to have folks internalize the value of going through this, right? It takes time, right? It costs money to, to you know, bring us on board and facilitate. You want, to get, you want to get value for that. So how do you do it? You want to make sure that the, the people who are going to use this uh, will benefit from it first and foremost, right? And then the organization as a whole will benefit. Uh, I'll share a story with you. We we're doing the work at the Susan Komen Foundation. And after we finished the first six steps and created something called the Promise Map, uh, which was their strategy map, they uh, changed the name to reflect their mission, Promise Map. Um, they did a video of uh, folks who went through the program, 30 or 40 employees uh, went through the, uh, the program with us, uh, most of them devoting two, three, four days to it. So it's not a it's not a full a full time commitment for you know six months or something, but anyway they did videos and they asked people what they got out of it. I'll never forget the reaction from a young lady. She said, "You know, I've been here for five years and I never really knew how I fit in." She said, "When I look at the promise map, I can see exactly where the work that I do and the folks who work for me how we make a difference." She said, "That's the first benefit. The second benefit was I've had conversations with people." that I never knew existed and who have things that I need and I have things that they need and we're sharing now. Um, how do you measure that as an, an ROI? You don't, you, uh, but that's what happens when you get smart people, the right smart people together in facilitated workshops and you let those conversations go. You get a lot of hard questions. You get deep dives into the stuff that matters a lot and uh, that that's how you that's how you how you develop a consensus around the you know the stuff that's uh, that's important so short answer uh, what are the benefits of going through a process like this for your organization and what pains does your organization currently have that this a process like this a discipline process is likely to make a difference in that's the way i would address it um, somebody else asked uh, the hard question here how do you define realistic uh, targets we uh, we spend some time in our uh, in our courses on that, and um, you know, there's a couple of ways that, uh, of course, you can do it. You can set aggressive goals, or you can set you know, we're likely to achieve these uh, goals. Uh, th th these are policy choices, right, that the organization makes. You know, we can look at historic performance uh, of our organization if we've already counted, if we already have used those measures. Uh, we can go to benchmarking. We can look at organizations that have similar processes and see how well they do. Um, you know, by way of example, when the Southwest Airlines was building their balanced scorecard, they ended up with a strategy map. Uh, one of the objectives uh, was improved cycle time, which to them was the turnaround time of the airplanes on the ground to get them in the, in the air faster to generate more revenue. As you know, Southwest Airlines sort of broke the mold of how to run an airline uh, 30 years ago. It started out as a regional airline in Texas. And uh, so that instead of benchmarking themselves against Pan Am or Delta or one of the other airlines, they benchmarked themselves against a racing crew, a pit racing crew, and watched how they, you know, turn around tires and fuel and all the other stuff that they do. And that's where you get the really uh, interesting stuff is to break out of the, you know, the, the, the common sense uh, solution would be to go ask another insurance company how they uh, process insurance uh, claims. But if you can find other people who process anything Right, that is a, is a paper and they turned it into electronic. And there's, there's value in that. So those are some of the things uh, that, that you can do. Uh, let's see, um, are there any other questions, Scott, that uh, you can think of that we should uh, be dealing with? Um, let me see, the, I answered some in the chat just on OpenGov specific, just a lot of people had question about cost um, our cost is based on the budget size of the organization we work with. So I showed a lot of city and county examples. We work with state agencies, individual departments within governments, and we base it on your operating budget. So um, that's how we can work with really small governments and then large governments as well. And it's an annual software service. Most uh, software is going to that model these days. So it's a, subscri a subscription that you pay annually. Uh, there's another question here. And where's the purpose statement? recorded in the strategy document. Um, I, would, uh, I would record it in the, uh, uh, the operating departments. I would record separate purpose statements at what we call tier two, uh, which would be the uh, business unit and support units in an organization. And I would stick with mission and vision statements at tier one, which would be enterprise-wide or corporate-wide uh, organization. I would not have 
uh, mission, uh, vision, uh, mission, vision, and purpose uh, at the high level. I would reserve the purpose statement for the uh, for tier two organizations to avoid uh, avoid any uh, confusion. Make it as simple as possible. Um, training on uh, program monitoring and evaluation. Uh, we get into uh, program monitoring and uh, evaluation in the um, in the new OKR course. And we'll have more of that in the strategy execution. Uh, we've come up with, um, based on our experience with uh, these 300 organizations, we've come up with five uh, strategic imperatives that an organization can work on to improve the implementation of the strategy. Uh, and one of those imperatives is uh, performance reporting, uh, performance informing, and performance uh, informing to, uh, to uh, evaluate and to monitor and to uh, use the performance information, the right chart for the right purpose, uh, along with uh, how do you use the information to, uh, to improve uh, performance. Uh, let's see, I think that's all that I see, uh, Scott. I think we're at uh, sort of at the end of our uh, yeah. hour. And um, I guess I close by saying, uh, you know, on behalf of, uh, of uh, both of us, uh, Scott and myself, Thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, listen to us and uh, hopefully you've learned some new things. You might be able to some, uh, apply some new things uh, when, you, uh, when you go back to work. It's been a pleasure, I appreciate it. Scott. Thanks everyone. Thank you.